comrades. This is Wadi Halabi speaking from uh, the Center for Marxist Education in Boston. This is part two of learning from the greatest defeats in working class history, uh, the counter revolutions uh, uh, in the 1980s and early 1990s, which uh, swept the working class from power in 12 states, above all the Soviet Union. Um, Part one placed uh, the defeats in the context of uh, capitalist crisis, um, crisis that uh, escalated in the 1970s and exploded in the 1980s. Uh, and I had a chart uh, the, uh, that demonstrated that, so that uh, despite uh, the relative stability of GDP, not of economy, not of society in the United States. So despite relative stability in the United States, uh, the rest of the world uh, was going undergoing uh, uh, almost an explosion of crisis. And by the mid to late 80s, the level of crisis actually exceeded that in the Great Depression years. Um, um, and uh, and of course, as a result, that intensified and impelled uh, world capitalism uh, uh, to escalate its uh, attacks on uh, the working class and actually uh, for the capitalists, uh, above all the monopoly capitalists, to escalate the attacks on other capitalists as well. But uh, above all, they escalated the attacks on the working class, and uh, and uh, the main target was the Soviet Union and uh, other states where the working class had taken power. But uh, uh, the special target was the Soviet Union and states allied with it. So in some ways, it could be said that China in particular escaped the worst of uh, what I uh, refer to as a typhoon. Uh, and uh, uh, as with the typhoon, the analogy drawn last time uh, is that afterwards we find some buildings have collapsed while others remain standing. Uh, uh, why did any building collapse? Typhoon hit it. Um, how come some buildings remain standing? Uh, and we look uh, at all the factors involved, starting with the foundations of the building. But uh, again, uh, quite a few factors are involved. And uh, uh, this the second part of the presentation essentially seeks to draw insights uh, from uh, the uh, survival of the Cuban state. Uh, it was damaged. Uh, it's not out of danger, uh, but it survived. Um, while uh, the same typhoon brought down the mighty Soviet Union and uh, 11 other states, uh, including Albania, Yugoslavia, Poland, the GDR, Romania. So um, um, there, uh, there are some thanks that I want to express. But first, let me ask some questions. What happened to the Soviet trade unions in this uh, critical period before the counter revolutions, when workers uh, under were under a great attack, not only in the Soviet Union but uh, worldwide. So remember PATCO and what followed in the United States in the 1980s, uh, and PATCO is uh, 1981. Uh, remember the great British miners' strike of 1984. So what happened to uh, the Soviet labor unions? What happened to unions worldwide supposedly committed to international solidarity? Um, a reminder, did the Soviet Union really export oil? Did Poland really export coal to Britain during the British coal miner strike? Uh, a second question, what happened to the Soviet army, which was sworn to defend uh, socialism? And it did its job in World War II under extraordinary uh, 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 military and political and economic challenges. Um, 
But come 1989, with working class rule under attack and then falling in the uh, GDR in Poland, Romania, and other neighboring states, uh, uh, what happened to the Soviet army? And by 1991, it's obvious that working class rule is uh, uh, in enormous immediate threat. Uh, what happened to that Soviet army? What happened to the Soviet of nationalities? Uh, this was one of Lenin's proudest creations, uh, consistent with his great contributions to Marxism on national liberation. Uh, I don't think I can emphasize enough the importance of national liberation in the struggle uh, for the working class to take power. So the Soviet nationalities was meant to protect the many oppressed nationalities in the Soviet Union. I believe there were at least 120 of them in 1990. It was supposed to protect them from great Russian chauvinism, never mind from imperialism. Um, that great Russian chauvinism exploded in the mid 1990s under Glasnost and Perestroika. What happened to the Soviet of, nas of nationalities? Take it up another level, what happened to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union? Its main task was not really national, but to advance, and I'm quoting from the manifesto, the common interests of the entire proletariat, independent of all nationality. Uh, uh, how come it didn't mention those common interests in the uh, years, maybe even decades, uh, before the counter-revolution? And in another sense, what happened to communist parties around the world? All of our parties are supposed to be distinguished from other working class parties only by our standing for the common interests of the entire proletariat, independent of all nationality. Those uh, common interests are summed up in the working class taking power everywhere. Uh, now, uh, by the mid 1980s to uh, 1991-92, working class power is under threat of being overthrown or actually overthrown. What happened to communist parties around the world? So, uh, uh, before moving to the uh, 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 body, let me thank uh, one party leaders for allowing me to. Uh, uh, present this class and uh, uh, to this hard-working D. Miles for organizing uh, what is the most comprehensive party education program in Marxism uh, in a long time. Uh, and uh, I want to mention this presentation has benefited uh, from discussions and forums over the past uh, 20 years, um, primarily organized by the Communist Party in Cuba, in Vietnam, and especially in China. Uh, many comrades have contributed to tonight's presentation. Uh, tonight, let me just mention uh, comrades Jin Hui Ming, uh, Li Shen Ming, Wu Enyuan, and Yu Shu Chun from the Communist Party of China, and uh, from the CPUSA, uh, in particular, help from uh, Emil, my wife Sandy, son Jonathan, uh, uh, John Womack, uh, Sam Samia Halaby, who shaped uh, the diagrams that uh, I showed last time and the different ones I'll use today, and also the late uh, Richard Levins. Um, and uh, also want to mention that this uh, study of the Soviet collapse has not been simply theoretical. It has already guided practice. Uh, uh, to mention two examples, um, the unionizing of all Walmart workers in China by the Communist Party of China uh, drew from the critical point that the real social base of states formed by socialist revolutions are the workers. And uh, uh, among other things, uh, Walmart management uh, had a long history of uh, not only violating labor laws in the United States and every capitalist country, but uh, they were even violating labor laws in China. Uh, 
but uh, the government was afraid that uh, challenging Walmart's uh, management would uh, uh, hurt uh, economic development in China. But after uh, this understanding that the real foundation of the state, including the Chinese state, are workers, uh, the Communist Party of China, by the way, not the unions in China, but the Communist Party of China uh, acted to uh, unionize all Walmart workers uh, with the first 17 stores unionized uh, from below um, before Walmart management caved in and actually uh, 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 started complying with uh, Chinese labor law. Uh, the second example, uh, in some ways on a much higher scale, uh, is the meeting of some 70 communist parties uh, in Shenzhen this past May, organized by the Communist Party of China. And uh, that's a, a real first in many, many decades. And, uh, uh, and that, that comes from the recognition that a not insignificant factor in the Soviet collapse was the absence of an organization of all communist parties worldwide, including the Soviet and the Chinese parties, that would allow identifying and resolving contradictions and developing common policies in defense against imperialism and uh, towards advancing the transition to socialism. Uh, and I should mention uh, tomorrow evening, uh, August 6th, our chair, John Bechtel, will uh, uh, probably discuss this meeting in Shenzhen and uh, his entire visit uh, uh, to China in May. So uh, um, we'll, uh, review quickly of guiding principles uh, in this work uh, include or start with confidence in the working class and its ability to face the truth and ability to correct errors. Uh, confidence in the communist parties as a definitive parties of the working class in the transition from capitalism to socialism. Um, and confidence in Marxism and its capacity to guide the way in the transition. So, uh, uh, in the first part of this webinar, uh, Joe raised quite an important question. Uh, was the fall of the Soviet Union primarily the result of external factors or internal? And, um, um, in, in some ways, this presentation is uh, an effort essentially to point out that similar, seemingly similar conditions can lead to victories or defeats, that the truth is a whole, uh, that there's so much to consider, and the more conscious we are of the many factors, the better we can avoid further defeats and uh, point the way to human liberation. Um, the last presentation uh, also pointed out, really the, the first one, part one, that uh, there's much we can learn from the Soviet collapse by studying the collapse of the Socialist International as World War I broke out in August 1914. Um, uh, but the same typhoon that brought down the Second International also opened the door for the victory of a Russian revolution just three years later, uh, the organizing of communist parties worldwide, the founding of a communist international in 1919, be 100 years next year, and the uh, reminder, Lenin considered the formation of a communist international as important an achievement as the Russian revolution itself. Um, but this points us to the importance of both objective conditions, uh, the failure of the old system. Uh, uh, we discussed last time how the uh, crisis of capitalism uh, impacted, uh, for example, Poland, and then impacted the Soviet Union, and then in turn how imperialism uh, concentrated uh, its attacks on those uh, 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 on the Soviet Union and Poland uh, 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 to destabilize them. Uh, 
um, so uh, um, but also the importance of subjective factors uh, the importance of a particular kind of political party of a working class that's guided by a non-privileged leadership that's solidly grounded in Marxism and able to apply it as conditions change from day to day. And uh, wow, Lenin was good at that. We can also learn much from studying the three great stress tests of working class rule in the uh, uh, decades before counter-revolutions, namely Hungary 1956, Czechoslovakia 1968, and in some ways uh, the one I consider the most important, uh, um, uh, Poland 1980-1981, uh, the rise of Solidarność. How could workers turn against their own state uh, and end up supporting uh, uh, bourgeois nationalists and the Catholic Church uh, against their own state. So, um, um, in any case, uh, for now, let's uh, move uh, to the first of, uh, well, probably be just uh, two diagrams, possibly three. Um, so, uh, um, um, let, let, let me see. So, th this is a diagram of uh, the Soviet. Uh, uh state so uh, oh okay uh, is it is that clear to you um uh, d is that visible to you yes it is yes okay so um uh, so uh, uh this is a diagram that's been used in presentations uh primarily in china also cuba uh, like all models, it suffers from simplifications, but that can also help us focus on critical um, uh, 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 factors. Uh, so, uh, uh, it tr instead of a building, a, a tree was also uh, considered. Um, Sorry. Um, so with a, tr a, a tr with a tree, with its roots, its trunk, its leaves, beneficial and harmful microorganisms, beneficial and harmful insects, and so on, uh, that might also have worked well. But for a variety of reasons, uh, uh, decided to uh, use a building, and uh, uh, but the tree could have worked. So. Uh, uh, the Soviet achievements were absolutely extraordinary. Uh, even, you know, uh, uh, some bourgeois historians, not particularly friendly to the Soviet Union, admit to the tremendous achievements uh, of, of, of the uh, Soviet Union, including, uh, and they often focus uh, on building of economy, uh, I think I mentioned last time, to me, the most impressive is that labor was always in demand and that uh, 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 you could, uh, at the age of 16, uh, quit your, uh, or 17, quit school and uh, uh, have several job offers. Uh, uh, but uh, on top of that, again, absolutely extraordinary in a variety of ways, a tremendous uh, uh, reduction, uh, but not complete reduction, uh, elimination of uh, inequality between men and women, uh, tremendous care of uh, children, what they sometimes in the Soviet Union was called our only privileged class. Uh, just one lovely thing after another, and also, not minor, uh, one defeat of the United States and 12 other imperialist countries when they invaded uh, in the early years of a civil war, uh, and then really defeat of imperialism in World War II. Uh, it wasn't just uh, Germany. Uh, 
fighting one way or another behind Germany was uh, uh, world capitalism. In, in any event, uh, and uh, the Soviet Union rose to account for about 21% of world production in 1988, uh, compared to about 23% for the United States. This is industrial and agricultural production. Uh, and yet, uh, this mighty building came uh, uh, crashing down, uh, and uh, ostensibly, uh, 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 in the case of the Soviet Union, when Yeltsin took over government offices in Moscow, the whole Soviet building uh, disintegrated. So, uh, uh, so, uh, so what this a uh, diagram in part tries to bring out, and uh, I, I don't know if you can see the cursor, but in any case, this massive building, in, uh, in some ways it could be said, was standing on, uh, uh, on one column. That column being uh, a government party intertwined with unions and, for example, equality organizations equality for women, uh, equality for nationalities, um, all under one discipline. And for a variety of reasons, the foundation that the building is standing on, as you see, is inadequate, considering the weight of what it was carrying above it. Um, so uh, uh, in, in many ways, it could be said there was poor flow of information uh, uh, especially bottom up, uh, and education and Marxism was ineffective. Uh, on, on your right, you'll see there's a very thin uh, line of uh, uh, marked currency. Uh, currency is extraordinarily important for balanced development after socialist revolution. Uh, and, and the same with pricing mechanisms. Uh, which uh, they should reflect changes in the cost of reproduction, as well as users' evaluation of uh, quality. So uh, committees that include uh, unions, consumers, whether industrial consumers or individual consumers, uh, managers, government, uh, should be setting prices. And uh, it should be understood uh, why changes in prices. So uh, uh, Soviet currency was not materially based, for example, uh, on gold, and was not usable in capitalist countries. Uh, and Soviet prices did not reflect changes in costs of reproduction or quality, uh, severe weaknesses, and labor productivity was low. Uh, so uh, if you want to double if you wanted to double the amount of steel produced in the Soviet Union, you opened up, uh, you doubled the number of plants out there. So, um, um, and again, very uh, difficult problems because you're also uh, attempting to uh, uh, maintain full employment. And by full employment there, it meant labor is in demand. By full employment in the United States, saying we have full employment now, 4% uh, is considered to be dangerously full employment. <laughs> uh, and we know what conditions are like for the majority of workers. So uh, uh, something to point out, the government is not synonymous with the state. Uh, the state is a sum total of the basic organizations addressing necessary tasks and periodic balancing mechanisms required to uh, essentially develop and implement state policies and to make the best out of a bad situation. The government is one of those basic organizations and its main task should be organization of the economy and of defense against capitalist restoration. Uh, so, uh, and both of those tasks involve more than the working class necessarily. Uh, especially in the early decades, but really throughout the life of the Soviet Union, uh, for China today and so on, it involves the workers, the peasantry, the self-employed, uh, above all the non-exploiters. Um, but uh, it's not just the working class. Um, 
But unions are another basic organization, and that is a purely working class organization. The it's necessary to defend workers' interests in the workplace. Um, Equality organizations such as for women or oppressed nationalities have their tasks as do environmental organizations and uh, not least there's this question of the party and the party's task as pointed out earlier is to represent the common interests of a proletariat irrespective of all nationality and yes that should hold true after a uh, revolution and uh, a very, diff very, very difficult and not obvious, certainly not in the early years. Or so, uh, but in retrospect, uh, again, um, uh, the importance of representation of those common interests of the proletariat uh, was critical to avoid uh, uh, tragedy. So, uh, um, in, in any event, uh, let me uh, move to the uh, uh, the representation of the Cuban state. So, uh, um, Okay, um, just this slide combines, whoop, what happened to it? So this slide uh, combines features of Cuba in 1988 with what we seek in a healthy state. So it's not meant to be a, really just a depiction of a Cuban state, um, but, uh, so Cuba is tiny, less than one half of one percent of world production, uh, not too far from uh, a menacing United States. Uh, the building stands on three columns. Uh, one is government and party intertwined. Uh, and uh, that's a weakness, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, uh, but government and party do have a stronger and more conscious base among workers than was found in the Soviet Union in 1988. Uh, for uh, a variety of reasons, including historical reasons that the unions in Cuba were organized uh, by the old Communist Party, uh, long before uh, the overthrow of Batista in 1959, not organized by the July 26 movement, by the old Communist Party. Uh, and certainly, with the help of uh, or efforts by International Labor Defense, organized by the CPUSA. And uh, they did a great job organizing the unions. Uh, 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 and that's part of, uh, I, I think, uh, a reason for that relative separation unlike the Soviet Union, uh, of uh, unions in Cuba from uh, that entwined government and party. And uh, uh, there's a record of uh, uh, effectiveness in uh, defending workers sometimes against government and party. And uh, 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 that, that can strengthen uh, the state, uh, again, the second column. The third column, the Women's Federations, uh, it's actually very interesting how the separation was achieved. Um, women operating in the uh, party, party members operating inside the Women's Federations were released from party discipline. They took party policy into consideration but if within the women's federations they uh, heard that this or that policy is crazy, they were free to change their minds on policy without uh, retaliation. And that uh, strengthened both the task of equality for women and um, it strengthened uh, the party 
and the state as a whole. So, uh, uh, so indications that the Cuban uh, state uh, was standing on three columns. And I'll get back. There's one more consideration of uh, culture that I want to get back to. Again, with Cuba, uh, point out uh, uh, currency and pricing is very weak, very problematic, has been throughout uh, uh, its history. And, uh, and uh, something uh, trying to address uh, in China and in Cuba. And so uh, it's very possible that cooperation between China, Cuba, Vietnam, uh, People's Korea, and uh, Laos uh, can help uh, all of them. And uh, it's uh, one of the achievements of the, of the Chinese state uh, is around currency and pricing mechanisms. So, uh, but uh, also want to point then to the arrows uh, in, uh, under one column, they they could be under all of them, uh, but uh, pointing up and down, so that uh, indications that the two-way flow of information uh, uh, was more effective in Cuba than in the Soviet Union. So uh, uh, then, um, want to point out at the base that the the base of the entire building, uh, if you look closely, the blueprint, is, uh, the base is the working class domestic and international. Obviously, primarily domestic, but domestic and international. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, the widespread support uh, for Cuba among the, uh, the working class, uh, not only throughout uh, the Caribbean and uh, the Americas, but uh, far beyond Africa, uh, is very significant. Um, the last arrow arrows that between columns uh, uh, is meant to point to uh, those mechanisms to resolve contradictions, which are very real between the tasks of the federations, the unions. The government, the party, really in Cuba, I could add environmental organizations. Maybe that could even be considered a fourth uh, column holding up the building. Um, uh, Cuba has the cleanest environment in the entire world uh, by far. Uh, in, in any event, the, the, there are contradictions between the tasks of the various organizations. Uh, uh, and uh, the arrows between those columns are meant to point to mechanisms to resolve uh, contradictions between those tasks and make the best out of a bad situation. So a reminder, uh, even after a socialist revolution, even a state as mighty as the Soviet Union, as massive and advanced now as China, all that the, uh, we can do is to make the best out of a bad situation. Uh, if the leaders come up with the very best solutions uh, on their own, uh, at the end of the day, what's left is a bad situation. And if they came up with it on their own, <laughs> the masses will blame the leaders for a bad situation. If we are involved in making the best of a bad, out of a bad situation, even if we don't come up with the very best solution, uh, our involvement will mean that we will know to protect uh, against uh, an imperialism and exploiting class that's constantly looking for the weaknesses to bring down the whole building. So, uh, uh, and uh, chances are that Cuba's size was a factor. It's, uh, China has 123 times the population of, of Cuba. Uh, you can just imagine. There are many cities in China that have a bigger population than all of Cuba. But uh, in, in any event, uh, but uh, size alone <clears throat> uh, uh, wasn't decisive. Uh, several of the states that fell in the 1980s and early 90s were smaller than Cuba. So, uh, uh, but again, looking at the totality of it, uh, so 
Cuba was hit by a, a harder typhoon than uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, signs that it was damaged. Uh, Scott Marshall and Bobby, went, I think, went to see their daughter at the medical school in Cuba a few years ago, and they attended the meeting of the Women's Federation and uh, told me uh, it was listless. So, but that was uh, 25 years after the Soviet collapse. So, um, uh, in any event, that, that's uh, uh, um, uh, the, the second of the diagrams uh, that I, I wanted to show. Um, depending on time, we may go to uh, it, really a question of uh, uh, what would a healthy state look like after uh, a revolution. But, uh, um, um, so there's so much to cover. So let, let me raise some uh, summaries that have uh, long struck me. Uh, here's one. When we called the Soviet Union socialist, we disarmed the working class. That's probably the shortest, most elegant description of what made counter-revolution possible in the Soviet Union. It was made by a delegate to uh, a uh, Congress of Communist Parties from the former Soviet republics in 1997, six years after the Soviet collapse. And it was reported by Scott Marshall, who attended the meeting. Uh, so what did that delegate mean? Uh, that uh, 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 Lenin, one definition Lenin used for socialism is uh, the point at which classes are dissolving and uh, hence the state, the organized and if necessary repressive uh, power of the working class, primarily liberating, but if necessary repressive of the exploiters, uh, it's the point at which classes are dissolving and the state can start dissolving. Uh, so um, calling the Soviet Union socialist, calling the Soviet state the state of all the peoples, all of that, uh, uh, like that delegate said, what it did was to disarm the working class. It was essential to maintain consciousness and practice of how to uh, for how to make it uh, conditions such for the working class to continually express its power. Uh, sometimes I think of uh, essentially the rules and traditions inside UE uh, to maintain rank and file control over the union. Uh, something lovely about them. Uh, very difficult to do. Uh, I think UE has taken a hit, but nevertheless, there was something about the rules, the culture of UE that really encouraged working class, the, uh, un the member control of the union. Uh, much more difficult after socialist revolution, but again, the focus on the, the working class power was critical. So, uh, uh, so repeat, Soviet Union was not a socialist country. It was a state formed by socialist revolution. Big difference. Um, another one, the party must speak the truth, no matter how difficult. Otherwise, the masses will stop believing us, even when we are speaking the truth. And uh, I'll just go to one example today that uh, says a lot, which is uh, the, uh, uh, the safety exercise at the Chernobyl nuclear plant in the Ukraine that went wrong in 1986. Um, the masses learned about uh, the meltdown at Chernobyl, um, uh, not from the Soviet leadership, but from the, from the capitalists, from Sweden, Finland, Denmark, 
uh, the calculus then moved to exaggerate the threat. And the uh, leadership of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union could have pointed out that uh, the U.S. had deliberately rained down tens of thousands of times as much radiation on humanity, both through the use of uh, atomic weapons uh, in Japan in 1945, and then with all of its uh, nuclear testing. Um, uh, the campus moved to exaggerate uh, the dangers from Chernobyl, not to be taken lightly, but to exaggerate it. And what happened then is uh, not only the Soviet masses, but the Soviet leadership stopped believing themselves and started believing the capitalists. And uh, that, that was pretty devastating. Uh, Chernobyl uh, was, uh, the meltdown was the night of April 26, 1986. Uh, Pravda published the first detailed account on May 6, uh, some 10 days later. And the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, counter-revolution in Poland, Romania, and so on, followed uh, within three years. So, and before that, terrible concessions, especially by the Soviet leadership, uh, to imperialism. Uh, another, uh, in order, so everybody agrees, yes, leaders should speak the truth. But more important is understanding that uh, in order for leaders to consistently speak the truth, they cannot be privileged. Why? We know from Marxism that those who benefit from exploitation tend to obscure the truth. Now, Soviet leaders didn't benefit from exploitation like the CEOs of capitalist corporations, never mind the owners who benefit a hundred times more. But nevertheless, uh, the leaders of uh, the uh, Communist Party of the Soviet Union, that of uh, those of Romania and so on, uh, did have privileges. Uh, they tended to be nice housing, uh, country dashas, uh, cars, international travel. And those privileges are ultimately born of exploitation. How? Because just the inequality between intellectual and manual labor, uh, between men and women, um, uh, and again, both were found in the Soviet Union in much reduced form compared to capitalist countries. But those inequalities reflect exploitation uh, commonly through unequal exchange. The, uh, women's labor is valued less than men's. Um, so uh, uh, a third, uh, another important point. Uh, a privileged leadership will tend to favor stability over tasks of socialism and international internationalism. Um, so uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, the threat of counter-revolution in the 1970s was almost unthinkable and not apparent until it was too late. I, I owe this formulation to Jonathan Holloway. Uh, the Soviet leadership shied from support for what should have been socialist revolutions in Lebanon in April 1976 and in Iran in 1979. Uh, I have studied both as closely as possible. In Lebanon, the, uh, the working class uh, defeated not only the Lebanese state, but the Lebanese uh, fascist, the Falange, uh, and uh, was in a position to take power. Uh, uh, in in uh, April 1976, uh, the uh, the revolution was crushed by Syrian forces riding Soviet tanks and trained by the Soviet army. Uh, so, revolution in Lebanon would have quickly spread to neighboring states, starting with Syria greatly weakening imperialism and strengthening the Soviet Union and the cause of world socialism. The working class uh, in the third week of April 1976 asked the Soviets to signal that they would defend revolution in Lebanon. Uh, and the Soviet leadership, after hesitation, it wasn't an immediate no, but declined. And that opened actually the door for the United States 
to tell the Israelis not to intervene and to signal to the Syrian army to come into Lebanon. And it moved uh, unmistakably against uh, uh, the working class organizations and to restore uh, bourgeois rule into Lebanon. So, um, uh, so fundamentalism then surges in the wake of a defeat. Uh, again, revolution in Lebanon would have quickly spread uh, to neighboring states, greatly weakening imperialism and strengthening the Soviet Union and the cause of world socialism. Instead, the defeat led to the surge in fundamentalism, which is far from over. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the same with Iran. In Iran, uh, workers uh, uh, formed the Soviets called Shoras, uh, which were uh, quite distressful and uh, hostile to the clergy. Uh, Iran had a thousand mile border with the Soviet Union. Uh, the working class uh, could and probably should have taken power in uh, 1979 or early 1980. Uh, but again, the, uh, the Soviet leadership was uh, reluctant to advance socialist revolution in Iran, which had a thousand mile common border with the Soviet Union. So. Then the clerical regime that arose in Iran immediately moved to collaborate with U.S. imperialism, the Saudis, and fundamentalism uh, against the, the Soviet army in Afghanistan. So uh, uh, what happened to the Soviet army? It was corroded by activities such as arming and training the bourgeois regime uh, in uh, Syria, uh, which at the same time was killing or imprisoning the uh, 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 Communist Party and uh, union members. So uh, another uh, factor uh, that uh, of effective two-way communication, uh, bottom up as well as top down, uh, that's essential to healthy expression of working class power. Uh, but among other things, uh, effective communication requires that everybody speaks the same language which means the language of Marxism. But education in Marxism uh, has consistently been a problem after revolutions. Uh, there's a, people would do anything to escape classes in Marxism in the Soviet Union. The same has been true that's changing in China. Same I hear is true in Cuba. So uh, in China, uh, leaders raised this with me, and after discussions uh, with comrades in Oakland and uh, with Richard Levins in particular, I made the recommendation that classes in Marxism be optional instead of mandatory, uh, while at the same time, Marxist analysis be brought into every field, from astronomy to astrology, uh, combined with polemics uh, against the bourgeois analysis of the same phenomenon. And above all, students of Marxism have to be empowered. Marxism is an activist philosophy. Uh, you can, if you uh, uh, try to learn Marxism, but you're disempowered, uh, nothing, you know, there'd be no interest. So uh, another, uh, that a culture of respect, solidarity, and commitment to the truth is essential and very difficult to develop this uh, society-wide after socialist revolution, but it's somewhat easier and essential to develop it within our parties before and after revolution. And the uh, culture is like the air we breathe, uh, seemingly invisible, uh, but essential. And again, I keep thinking of the culture within UE, uh, at least as I knew it uh, 20 and, uh, years ago or longer. Uh, but uh, uh, something that we need to pay a lot of attention to. Again, the culture of respect, solidarity, and commitment to the truth, above all within the party. Uh, there is so much more to raise, but I wanted to uh, open this to discussion and let's see where this leads. So uh, thank you very much.
Okay, the floor is open. Uh, if you'd like to uh, make a comment or introduce a question, please use your uh, the hand image, click the raise hand icon, and I'll be able to open your mic. You have a comment or you have a question, please click your raised hand icon and I'll be able to open your mic. Ishmael, your mic is open. Ishmael, your mic is open. Okay, if you have a question or a comment, please just click your hand. Tony, Tony, oh, there you are. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, just very interesting discussion. And I'm just wondering if there's any way to be in touch with Wadi and on furthering the discussion. I have comments that are questions that's long interested me because of my work, but more than I can try to get into here, I'm wondering if there's some way to be in touch to uh, further the discussion. I might say one of my main angles comes from 50 years of work on issues between native and non-native peoples in Alaska and elsewhere. As part of that, I spent a year living in the Russian far northeast opposite Alaska. And that was an eye opener in terms of many of the issues that have been raised. More than I can get into here, I'd love to be in further touch if there's some way to do that. Thanks. Anyone else? Just click your, your hand icon and I'll be able to open your mic. Les, your mic is open. Les. Uh, Bayless, your mic is open. All you have to do is speak. Okay, we don't hear you for some reason. Use your raised hand, just click your the hand. Click the picture of the hand and I'll be able to open your mic. Eric, your mic is open. You have to click your mic. Click the picture of the mic so that you open it on your end. You're open on, on my end. There you are. Speak. Uh, did you mean me, Eric? Yes. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm using my iPhone, it's a little primitive. <clears throat> um, uh, before, uh, Sadi, you mentioned, uh, the, the, especially in connection with the Polish workers, but I think it applies more broadly, uh, that they, they, ref they refuse to uh, respect uh, their, uh, the interests, their, their own interests in their own workers' state. And uh, I'm, I'm curious about that formulation, because uh, I wonder if that in retrospect, seems like a definition uh, imposed on the situation uh, and, and not something that the workers themselves felt. Obviously, they, they felt that the repression and the lack of access to uh, you know, having a voice in society, the lack of information, lack of truth, as, as, you, as you say, uh, the, the authoritarianism in the workplace, in educational institutions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All that kind of added up to kind of making it look like it wasn't their state. Can you comment on that? Yeah. Right. Um, so I, I sometimes describe uh, what happened in Poland to the occasional decertification by workers of their own union, 
um, and uh, uh, workers had plenty of reason to uh, be angry, uh, like uh, I think we agree, including lack of truth, uh, repression. Uh, in the case of Poland, uh, came down uh, with to martial law. Uh, uh, reinstitution of the six day work week in an effort to pay debts owed to imperialism, imperialist banks. Um, so, um, 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 the result of the decertification in the case of Poland has been absolutely devastating to workers and to youth and to women, almost hard to describe. Uh, uh, same in other states. Uh, minors honored every year for their uh, hard work uh, and other uh, manual workers, again, honored for their work, uh, now reduced to uh, bringing their uh, children and mining on their own uh, uh, with the police uh, repression. Um, this is under bourgeois rule now. Uh, uh, often to uh, extract uh, bribes from miners desperately trying to uh, dig up uh, some coal or some other uh, mineral. Um, so, um, so one, the solution, decertification of a union, or uh, in the case of Poland, support for a bourgeois force, the Solidarnosc, supported, which was supported by the United States, by the Vatican, uh, by world capitalism, um, um, has led to just devastating defeats and an explosion of extreme poverty. In the case of the Soviet Union, according to demographers, they have not seen a demographic collapse uh, like happened in the Soviet Union, in uh, uh, the Russian Federation after counter-revolution in uh, more than uh, 600 years since the uh, uh, plagues in the 1300s. Um, and uh, the condition of uh, children, uh, just unspeakable, even six and seven year olds uh, selling their bodies to try to uh, uh, get some bread. Uh, if you follow public health literature, uh, as I do, you often uh, uh, see reports of that and worse. In any event, um, so clearly the um, solution uh, is to try to strengthen our union, to strengthen our state. No easy matter. And this is partially then where it comes in, in terms of the international factor, uh, where uh, communist parties and union and unions around can help each other in terms of addressing challenges like Poland faced, and uh, and avoid counter revolution. So uh, uh, the best we can do now is to learn. Uh, we most certainly want to avoid. Uh, uh, if at all possible, repression like the Polish regime used against uh, workers, um, uh, because all that, that did was to uh, 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 accelerate the pace of counter revolution. All it did was to push workers even further into the hands of counter revolution. So, uh, so in some ways, that analogy. <clears throat> with a union that uses some awful methods, uh, including thuggery against members, um, that the response isn't to break up the union, to smash it, but to figure out how to strengthen it. And uh, uh, no easy task, but uh, that's part of why we're having this discussion, is uh, <clears throat> that. Uh, uh, conditions like uh, developed in Poland in 1980 or in Hungary in 1956 
are uh, uh, can happen in the states uh, in the five states remaining today, where the working class holds power. So I should say the working class holds power in that it's indirect. To begin with, the working class operates through organization. The organizations uh, are imperfect. Um, <clears throat> uh, so the holding of a power is uh, not direct, but indirect. And uh, 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 the example of how relatively impoverished Cuba could survive the stresses that uh, the Soviet state uh, could not uh, <clears throat> is uh, provide some guidance. So doing what we can uh, in the case of a Poland uh, to make the unions in Poland more effective and capable to um, defend workers against their own state if necessary. <clears throat> uh, a, a, uh, uh, I, I take this from Lenin, um, uh, was necessary. Uh, developing uh, the ability of women's federations to uh, protect women against uh, uh, the injustices uh, to be found across the society. Uh, environmental uh, tasks. So, um, uh, and then there are in some ways uh, specialist tasks like around currency uh, that are important. But basically, again, involving uh, developing uh, that relative separation between the organizations addressing necessary tasks combined with um, the mechanisms to resolve contradictions among tasks. So, uh, uh, but yeah, the solution that uh, uh, is what seemed to be the only path for uh, Polish workers. Uh, uh, out of uh, uh, the, uh, what they uh, were suffering uh, ended up being no, not only no solution, but has led to terrible defeat. Uh, the birthplace of Saladarnask, uh, the Gdansk uh, shipyard, Lenin shipyard in Gdansk, um, uh, not long after Kaplan's power, Kaplan's rule returned to Poland, that shipyard was shut down and all those workers were thrown into unemployment. Uh, I've heard of some of them ending up in England uh, doing some of just the worst tasks. Um, and it goes on. So, uh, uh, but this in part is what this discussion is about, both uh, to protect the five remaining uh, states where the working class holds power, however indirectly, however in a sense, in a historical sense rather than directly, um, that's important. But it's also important in terms of how to organize working class power after the next seizure. And, uh, and I, that's, the best answer I can give you right now. Uh, don't know if it's helpful. Okay, we'll ask uh, again if you have a have uh, uh, want to make comment or uh, introduce a question. Please use your raised hand icon. Emil, your mic is open. Hello again, Wadia. Uh, this is Emil Skeppers. Thank you again for a wonderful presentation. Uh, and uh, just a couple of things. First of all, uh, you mentioned UE. Perhaps it's important for some of our listeners who may not be familiar with that is United Electrical Radio and Machine Workers of America, a, a exemplary independent labor union with democratic and left-wing leadership. Uh, I. Uh, I have the following question. When we look at all the mistakes that were made and all the disasters that they led to, uh, how does one get out of a pattern in which workers see in, in, a, in a, a, social, a state aspiring to socialism? 
in which workers see their unions and the production process as Santa Claus instead of themselves doing for themselves? That's my question. Can you, can you repeat that? How to get out of this pattern? Oh, uh, where workers tend to look at not only the socialist government, but even things like their own unions as Santa Claus as something that's supposed to give them something instead of the unions, especially being mechanisms whereby they organize the production and do for themselves. Right. Um. So part of it is consciousness in terms of the importance of the work we're doing um, um, to advance the transition to socialism. So um, um, Part of it is for workers to have a sense of control over the workplace and that problems that they raise are addressed, uh, may not always be solved, but that leadership takes uh, seriously when workers are raising problems. Part of it can be use of market mechanisms. Um, uh, so that there is an incentive to work uh, uh, that goes both ways, uh, and this is both collectively and individually, that uh, good work is uh, rewarded collectively and individually, that bad work is uh, 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 sanctioned collectively or individually. So uh, as uh, Lenin said, uh, not long after the Russian Revolution, uh, we need to go to campus school. Uh, and uh, something fascinating, I should have known it, but fascinating to me is that the young Deng Xiaoping was studying in Moscow when the NEP was being discussed in the 1920s. And uh, I guess it left a deep impression on him. So, uh, uh, Part of it is, again, continuing the, uh, the struggle uh, against capitalist rule anywhere. And uh, so that uh, the work week can be reduced. Um, part of it may be uh, that uh, factories and unions are involved in not only in terms of uh, defense of the workers uh, at their workplaces, but in things like international solidarity. And so that there's a sense of uh, essentially helping humanity move forward. So combination of uh, uh, collective and individual uh, incentives of collective and individual in some ways sanctions um and uh and uh, uh my bet is that there's much to be learned uh from good and bad experiences in all of the states where the working class has taken power including those that fell that they're uh, tens and hundreds of thousands of examples, some of them uh, very poor, and, but some of them very interesting in terms of uh, avoiding uh, what you described. So, uh, Okay, I'm going to try to open um, to see if less, Les, your hand is up. Your mic is open. You just need to speak. Les Bayless, your your mic is open. 
Okay. On behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank uh, Wadi for uh, participating in this class series uh, with us. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, tuning in. Everyone who registered will receive a copy of the recording. If you want to show that last um, slide, Wadi, you can, so that it'll be a part of the recording. That last slide on the state. Oh yes. That let, let me see if I if I brought it up. Um, um, yeah, here it is. Just click it. Yeah. Well. There you are. All right. So now it'll be a that'll be a part of the of the a slide uh, uh, the recording uh, set of slides as well. So again, uh, would you like to make some closing remarks? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we have a little bit of time. I don't want to take much, but uh, uh, I hope most of the people who are uh, on this webinar are too young to remember this. But there was a saying: uh, the Washington senators, first in war, first in peace, last in the American League. Uh, the senators were the worst team in baseball for years after years until they were mercifully retired. And uh, um, where I'm going with this is actually uh, that uh, the experience of the past 101 years now is uh, the communist parties, first in victory, first in defeat. Uh, there must be a comedian on the party staff who, I mean, a comrade who can provide a punchline. But uh, the point is, is that communist parties have been at the head of every major victory over capitalism since the Russian Revolution, including in Vietnam, People's Korea, Albania, Yugoslavia, Laos, and, and so on. Uh, unfortunately, communist parties have been at the head of every major defeat including counter-revolution in Albania, Yugoslavia, Hungary, Poland, and above all, the Soviet Union itself. Uh, so, uh, um, but uh, um, there was something so extraordinary about the Russian Revolution uh, that the parties that it created, or parties worldwide, are unlike any in uh, written history. Uh, in written history, uh, uh, normal political parties uh, uh, historically could not recover from a sweeping defeat like the Communist Party of China suffered in 1927. And worse yet is that the Communist International leadership guided the Communist Party of China into that defeat. And despite that, we know what party was at the head of the Chinese Revolution uh, 22 years later and that continues to lead the Chinese state. So essentially, our parties will be decisive in hu for human history. Um, without our parties' initiatives, basically humanity's transition to socialism will not be completed. Um, in, in one way, this is one of the unexpected lessons of the worst defeats in working class history, is our parties will be decisive and uh, remain decisive. Uh, um, so, but um, without uh, essentially uh, having a scientific Marxist analysis of what could make this, those defeats possible, and then taking the steps to correct uh, those weaknesses, uh, essentially be very difficult uh, to uh, complete the transition. Um, and finally, we can identify uh, our parties, the communist parties, by who participates in the annual international meeting of communist and workers parties. Uh, I think there were 103 parties from around the world at the last meeting, which was in Moscow and Leningrad, marking the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution. And, uh, and now also we had this meeting in Shenzhen with 71 uh, parties and the CPUSA participated in both. 
And uh, discussions like today in terms of um, identifying and addressing the weaknesses that made possible the Soviet collapse uh, is an essential and important step forward towards humanity completing uh, its liberation. Uh, so, so thank you very much, uh, Dee, and all of you, and uh, uh, counting on seeing you at the convention in Chicago, uh, uh, June 23rd of uh, 2019. Thank you so much. Okay, everyone, thank you for participating, uh, and good night. Thank you, Adi. Thanks, Dee.